I didn't actually hear that. Could you do it again? <laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs> there we go. Okay, we're good. That was the teensiest clap in history <laughs> from our guest, Chris Sure, <laughs> wonderful comedian, extraordinaire, bell of the ball of Connecticut. The phantom clapper of the, of New England. <laughs> Chris Sure, how you doing? I'm not I'm doing good. You know, just clean my apartment today. Try not to die of coronavirus. Actually, I'm not trying that hard. I, at this point, just take me out of this world. It's terrible. Yeah. Do you have? Do you think you have? Oh wait. First off, we just say uh, welcome to Two Nosy Meerkats episode four with uh, me, Lucas Arnold, with me, Gabby Jordan Brown, the two mommy meerkat and daddy meerkat um, over we here with our daughter meerkat, Chris. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We like to be very heteronormative here. We're very this is a mommy and daddy, and that's what the American family is founded upon. We're a very American podcast. Yes. You know those classic American meerkats. Yeah. Uh, you know that meerkat who lives in Manhattan. He eats pizza. He beats his wife when he gets home from the mill. He's, oh, he has uh, pizza meerkat. You yeah, see him meerkat. on the C train. No. <laughs> He has a gut and a sauce stain on his on his <laughs> on his uh, vest. I forgot the word wife beater. That's it. That's not a nice he's, word. But he's worried about immigrants, even though he is an immigrant. Yeah. Yeah, he's Russian, but he's like That's I'm not one, like the yeah. other ones. Oof, rough. <laughs> I'm correct, kind. <laughs> I came here legally from Russia. So wait, Chris, have you have you been feeling well? Have you had any? Uh, because like me and Gabby, just before uh, you came on, we were talking about how um, Gabby had a little bit of an upset stomach. And yesterday I had a little acid reflux and how every time we feel the slightest twinge of anything less than good health, we think, oh, it's we have the Rona. We yeah, for sure. Also, it's like, it sucks because I'll get sick. I don't know if this has happened to you. I'll get sick and then I'll be like, it's definitely COVID. Then I'll go get a negative test. And then I'm like, well, fuck, now it's something else I have to deal with. And I don't want to deal with something that isn't the only thing I've been thinking about for six months. See, lucky for me, I do enough shit that's bad for me that there's other things I can immediately assume. Like if I mm. cough, I'm like, oh, that's Jewel. Oh. Like if my, <laughs> if my throat hurts, it's like 19 seltzers a day. Uh, I stubbed my toe and I was like, oh, it's probably all that crack I've been smoking. So the moral of the story is, that actually is a good point because I feel like people- The moral of the story is ruin your health in more ways so that COVID is just a small little concern for you. I was going to say that, like people who eat well, if they eat one chocolate bar, their whole day is ruined. If you just only eat chocolate bars, you'll never feel anything. Physically, yeah, emotionally, mentally, <laughs> spiritually, yeah. you'll, you'll numb really, yourself. You'll feel your foot fall off one day. That's, that's future Chris's problem. <laughs> and you won't assume it's COVID. Yeah. No. It's like, it's the way Donald Trump uh, saturates the media with like gaps and shit. It's just like, you can't focus on him being racist for one thing because he just moves on to the next. And that's the way you should do it with your health. That's what we're saying. Be like Trump, the way Trump is to the media, be like that to your body. My God. That's what we're saying. <laughs> Make America great again. What's popping? <laughs> Already we've said we're heteronormative. <laughs> we've said that we're pro-American. This is a very, we are a Republican podcast now. We are <laughs> Ben Shapiro, wherever you are. Zaddy, come talk to us. Did you guys see Ben Shapiro, um, who, if listeners, because I think we got a lot of teen listeners who might I think, yeah. get to avoid knowing who Ben Shapiro is, which is a good thing, but I'm about to ruin it. He's just this right-wing asshole who tweets, and he, someone made fun of him for, like, not having good sex with his wife. Which is just like something that like people say to you on Twitter if you're famous. Oh, your sex with your wife probably sucks. But he responded being like, actually, my wife and I have a wonderful sex life. <laughs> I feel like it's just the worst way to respond to any kind of burn. Oh, my. I have not seen that. That's that is it. I'm just imagining him like defending himself. Well, well uh, hypothetically, if I were to not satisfy my <laughs> wife, why indeed would she stay with me? So uh, your your argument is mute is moot. But by your logic, everyone <laughs> comes every time. <laughs> uh, statistically, we live in a no, go on, we Chris, live, please. 
we live in a capitalist society, so therefore the wi- the winners get to orgasm. My wife is a big loser. That's why I married her. So therefore, I'm the only one coming. That's why my dick is wet and she has a vagina drier than the Sahara Desert. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. Go on. <laughs> if he just owned it, you you wouldn't like him, but you'd kind of respect it. Just like, all right, well, at least he's aware. At least he's aware of the effect he's not having. Yeah, I feel like I'd like that too. I feel like it always really bothered me, those men on the internet who were like, I love making a woman come like 47 times a day. Because it's like, that's exhausting. Like, no, you don't. You know, just admit you just, even even like lesbian discourse online. I'm sure, Chris, you've seen this, like deep diving into lesbian culture of people being like, lesbian sex is the best sex in the entire world. It's like, you know, that's actually a lot of pressure. And to I be think honest, pressure makes sex less fun. Wait, go on. To be honest, it's made me like direly nervous because I used to be a straight dude. That means I eat pussy like a straight dude. Mm-hmm. So therefore I can't, it's like going from little league baseball and suddenly I'm starting for the Yankees. <laughs> and there's just a, there is a, a stadium full of my peers where I feel like if I go down on a lesbian badly, oh the whole God. lesbian community is going to know about it. They're going to be like, oh, she's not really a woman. She can't uh, make a lesbian come 745 times in 37 minutes. So uh, she didn't pass the test. I've never thought of that. So it's just like so much is expected of you so fast from switching or trans- from transitioning. It's like, I'm just, I feel like I'm walk, I'm going to show up and I'm just going to like wallow in and there's going to be a lesbian splayed out on the bed. And I'm just going to like, be like, what about my dick? And she's like, that's useless. <laughs> <laughs> I want nothing to do with that. Service me, tranny boy. <laughs> I think if it and makes I- you feel better, the worst sex I've ever had was with a woman who claimed she called herself like a sex beast who's had sex with like hundreds of women and then she went down on me and i couldn't come it was the worst sex i've ever had i i can't relate to that but all i thought when you said tranny boy was oh tranny boy (laughs) (laughs) the orgasms the orgasms are are falling see i I, if i go into sex i'm gonna be like very humble about it i'll be like well, um, I have been told that I'm all right at sex, but it's really just up to you. I'll do my best. I'll, uh, I'll give it the old college try. Uh, we can always use a vibrator. I, I know I'm useless. I'm like the American auto industry. You should try and get rid of me as fast as possible and replace <laughs> me with a machine. <laughs> You're like the American auto industry. Eminem's going to be advocating <laughs> just outsource my tongue to China. Just <laughs> I'm like the American auto industry. I only got airbags recently. Yay! <laughs> that was beautiful. This reminds me of something I forgot to mention. I feel like at one point I was thinking about doing this podcast and I was like, I'm sure at some point I'm going to be talking to two Chris Schurz at once because Lucas has that incredible impression of you. <laughs> And if you pulled it out, it'd be like, oh, my God, there's two of you. Oh, my God. <laughs> Wait, Chris, can I ask, when I first did it for you, I think it was over, I think it was over uh, uh, the note to self, Mike, what was your reaction? What was your immediate thought? I was like, damn it, it's better than I do me. Oh. Aw. Like, I, I don't, I didn't really remember. I, I remember, I thought the first time you did it was at Lee's mic. Which I thought it was fucking hilarious. But I just, oh, I true. knew you had it. I didn't know when it was going to get brought out in front of me. Because, yeah. like, Lee had sent me a video where she's like, Lucas is doing the oh, funniest impression it. of you. Yeah, no. So oh. I had seen it, but, like, not in person. Okay. And I, I was in a shitty mood the night she sent it to me. So I was like, I'm going to hold off on this because I'm being a sensitive little bitch right now. <laughs> And I watched it in the morning, and I was like, yeah, this is really funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. You also did an incredible Lucas impression, I heard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> your, your me impression, was, it just made me smile. <laughs> wait, okay, so wait, I guess we should just do our impressions of each other right now. 
So do you want right. to do do me first? Do me first. No, I think it has to be you go first since yours okay. is actually good. Okay. Okay, I'll do it. So um Yeah. The thing about transitioning that just fucking sucks is that I wasn't I wasn't prepared for how it affected your digestive system. Oh, estrogen does a real number on you. Like my asshole is so loose, my shit just comes out and so long it coiled. It's like in a little ice cream pile right there in the toilet. And when I looked in the bowl, I had a dilemma because it looked like the kind of penis I wanted when I was a man, but also the kind of dick I want shoved in my ass now I'm a woman. So I just masturbated right there on the toilet. No. Oh. You see, it's not just an amazing shit joke, but it's an amazing transition joke. Oh. Oh. That'll get better over time. I'm such, I'm such an idiot. <laughs> Not the self-deprecating tag at the end. It's so good. <laughs> oh my god. Yes, yeah, and then this is my impression of Lucas. I was like, my name's Lucas. I only sleep with exotic women and just eat red meat. Like an American. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that sounds like Trump. That's... <laughs> Only just, dates like, yeah, only eats, uh, eats, uh, only eats like burgers and has Coke and then exclusively dates like Slovenian women, I think. <laughs> but that's like, I just was going for the opposite of what Lucas is. Yeah. I was going for the anti impression. Here's my yeah. impression of Lucas. Ooh, I was at Walter Reed the Hospital. Ooh. <laughs> Here's my impression of Lucas. Build the wall. I hate immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that is so him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here's my oh, last we... impression of Lucas. Please. Here's my impression of Lucas. Women belong in the kitchen, and if you don't show them a good hand, they're never going to fall in line. <laughs> So true. Oh my God. So true. You know how, you know how Lucas asked me to do this podcast. He said, yeah. if you, if you don't well, do you it. Were, you were in the kitchen wearing your apron as you should. And then what did I say? <laughs> you were like, if you don't help me get famous off of this podcast, um, I'm going to make sure that you never have a career in comedy. I'm going to tell the cancel police. Um, I'm going <laughs> to <Yeah. laughs> fuck I'm you gonna up. I'm going to work in my assault into a contract between us that allows me to get just a little bit in before you, before you rat me out to the police. We're just Harvey Weinsteining this. Oh my God. Then Lucas was like, high five to seal the deal. And Gabby's like, and then he's like, bam! <laughs> Face five! Face <Yeah>. five, yeah. <laughs> this is a cry for help, actually. <laughs> this whole yeah. thing. That's why we record this on video, <laughs> so I'm that just... everyone. I, I wonder if fans are gonna start writing in, like Gabby, blink twice if you're doing this against your will. Oh please, this won't hold up in court. <laughs> this will. <laughs> For those listening, I just blink twice. But I guess you can't tell everyone you blink twice because then he's gonna know. Wait, wait, can you do that again? Because your your mouth, you're like ah. Uh, it was like, it was so much effort. I can't blink without my ma mouth open. It's like trying to put mascara on without your mouth open. It's scientifically impossible. Wait, you can't blink, wink without your mouth open? No, of course. Uh, can you? Am I winking? I can't even tell at this point. I, I'm, yeah, I can, I can wink with, with my mouth closed. I'm, yeah. This is just something, pe okay, the gymnastics freaks, okay, scientists <laughs> who just know how to do cool shit. Wow. Impressions, <laughs> wi winking with your mouth closed. Changing wait, wait, from a man into a woman. Eh? Well, that's, yeah, that's crazy talk. <laughs> you got the my and Mor we're Mighty Morphin Power Rangers over here. Gabby can't do shit. <laughs> You're just the dude Gabby. in the screen. <laughs> Gabby's like, well, I can make a, co a woman come 1,000 times in an hour and a half, so. You know, it's funny you say that. I can't. Just but... Clint McGee over here. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in high school, 
my friends and I had this in joke. I don't know where it came from. I think it came from just being horny, but it was like on your birthday for every year you turned, you had to have that many orgasms in a row plus one for good luck. So if you were like, (laughs) I don't know, 10, you got to have 11 orgasms in a row. But if you were like 70, you had to have 71 orgasms in a row. That like a, that made my balls wince. Like... <laughs> it's the worst. They, and so when Facebook timelines were a thing, my friend wrote on my Facebook timeline, like a post for each because I turned 16. So it was like, number one, you're pleased. Number two, you're impressed. Number three, you just want to cuddle, but there will be no cuddling. Number four, you pass out. <laughs> it just kept going. God. Like birthday punches, but instead of punches, it's fisting. Because you know everyone comes uh, from yeah. fisting. I certainly do. <laughs> Who here's I've been never... fisted? <laughs> Who here hasn't been fisted? <laughs> this is actually, I, I do want to ask, like, the both of you, like, what would you say is, like, the mo- most times you've come in a single day? Uh... I don't know, like four or five. I'd say I would say, f- I would say four is tops for me. I don't think I have ever done five. I was just curious, cause like, no, cause when he said like seventy one, I was like, is that even possible for like, of any ge- like? Definitely cause... not. Yeah, no. It was just I mean, us being idiots in high school. It was definitely not. Yeah. Scientifically possible. I'm now wondering, Google. like, what is the record for, like, how many orgasms someone has had in a single day? Well, Google.com will we, reveal. If only we had a search engine for exactly this purpose. <laughs> what even is the search term for this? World record. World record for mm-hmm. orgasms. Was Guinness there? Whoa! Okay, in 1966, doctors from the Center for Marital and Sexual Studies in California said that a woman enjoyed, did she really? <laughs> <laughs> but I digress, right in the entry. Uh, did she? One, 134 orgasms over the course of an hour. This would you not this- just... Would your vagina not just be like sandpaper by the end? Like, you'd just be depleted? She probably did it with an ID in her arm. <laughs> you need also, sustenance. A loving yeah. assist. Also, it was the 60s. They had no idea what a woman's orgasm was. That was probably just her cooking eggs. And each time the egg hit the frying pan, they're like, she obviously <laughs> orgasmed. She's cooking for a man. They're like, yep, that was an orgasm. She was like, I just sneezed. <laughs> And, and like, and there, and she just like taking a single step. Oh, there's another one. She was like, I'm fucking walking. Like, it turns out like, she's like, no, I had no orgasms that day. They were just recording every muscle twitch in my body. Just. She was like, I'm, I was just especially gassy that day. I farted 160 <laughs> times, not orgasm. You know, there are many people who find farts erotic, like James Joyce. Mm. Did James Joyce find farts erotic? Yes. He wrote letters to his wife girlfriend lover whatever nora being like every time you farted like i fucked the farts out of you i'm serious that's definitely in there whoa if you're into farts like do you just want to be in a room full of farts or do you want those farts directly down your throat Uh, does it if a tree falls in the forest i have been (laughs) (laughs) does it fart (laughs) I think there's also like I've definitely been shown a video of like a woman with like a funnel taped to her butt with a tube taped to a dude's uh, mouth and nose and he just liked being sort of like restrained and not being able to move while she just like indirectly farted right at him yeah I think that's not that's not being into farts that's being into like humiliation yes yeah I'm talking about like direct arousal just from farts hmm like Odell Beckham Jr. is to shitting on, getting shit on your chest as right. farts. I'm trying to think, like, I, because I know there's like a dude who like just. I, did you guys also get obsessed with strange sex on TLC? 
of seeing people like weird, what turns people on weirdly. Yeah, I, I didn't, I wanna hear about it. There's a, there's a dude who just gets turned on by the smell of women's shoes. So he like buys women's shoes off the internet and he just like sniffs them and that's what gets him off. So to be clear, a woman hasn't even worn the shoes. It's just like- Oh no, I think she's worn the shoes. I think she's okay. worn the shoes. And well, it has thank like a little, God. Yes. Feminism. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, I think it was just like getting turned on off like just a woman's foot smell. That was just, that was his thing. And then there's also like a dude who likes humping balloons. There's all sorts. Humping balloons. Lunars, they're called. Lunars. they it's sexually attracted to balloons. Do, are the balloons blown up or? Yes, yes they are. What a they're stupid question. Like, I was about they're to... not just like loose, empty balloons, like used condoms. Just everyone's just like, oh yes. The... Cause I was gonna say, is it like a fleshlight situation where they like blow it up with their dick? No, it's, it's definitely around like squeezing like balloons and stuff. And well, that like... sounds nice. I wouldn't say yeah. erotic, but it sounds like sweet. Yeah. I don't know. The... I, I thought of that at first, but then I heard like the squeaking of like latex against latex, and it's like, mm, um, eh. it was a little. It wasn't. It wasn't good to the senses, at least for me. Um, yeah, yeah. go on. Sorry. You think, you think he tries to like pop the balloons? Like, is that the goal to puff the balloon so hard? That's a pop? subset of lunars, poppers. The po I <laughs> I remember this episode so well. <laughs> there's like specifically there's people who like to honor the balloon not pop it but just like hump it or jizz on it or whatever and then there are those who like popping balloons so you know how there are divides different. in different communities like there, like there's always like drama like the you know the liberals and the left have like drama yeah. and then like between the left there's drama do you think there's drama like in the lunar community of like these fucking poppers are all over the convention and I just so want to jizz on they the balloons. They don't balloon. honor. They don't honor balloons. <laughs> it's like the Capulets and Montagues of Kink World and then like they have a, they both have shots <laughs> that they get together against all odds. Boz Lerman, if you're listening, make this movie because I need to oh know. <laughs> um, doing a hard pivot here, Chris, yeah. last time Lucas and I were recording we were talking about the weirdest porn we've both ever seen mm, and you yes. have an incredible story about that specific subject I'm so excited which one well that's alarming first of all but second of all <laughs> I'm I'm already hard just get just get going wait on sorry are you talking about the lesbian bukkake video I was yes okay yeah Amazing. so I, I found this when I was like 14 or something. It was this video called Lesbian Bukake. So if you know what a regular Bukake is, where it's like one girl and there's like 900 guys and they all jizz all over her face. And then at the end, they're like, you're glazed. <laughs> uh, well, now imagine if the same thing was going on, but instead of dudes jerking off, it was women squirting on another woman. Mm -hmm. And so I found this amazing video. And so it's like a, a lesbian pool party where there's lesbians abound and they're all topless and bottomless. And it follows the story of this one woman and she like walks over to a, a beach chair or whatever and just starts sitting there and like slowly masturbating. Mm -hmm. And then as she's masturbating, more and more women just come over and like just squirt all over her, except for her face. And the more I watched it, the more I was like, why aren't they squirting on her face? That's like kind of the point. Like yeah. they really should squirt on her face. And right when I saw that, this one girl just comes over and just squirts all over her face. And this woman freaked the fuck out. She was like, no, we made the agreement. I talked to the director that I would not get any squirt on my face. Gets up, storms out. Whoa. It pans up to the girl who squirted on her face and she's like what's she even doing here <laughs> and, <laughs> end of video that was me um, actually i just broke onto the set just to <laughs> pee on a woman's face and pretend it was squirt just like in sweatpants with popcorn just like what is that it just like just very confused and i was just like why'd they leave that part in there it was a solid 25 minutes before she ended up getting squirted on her. They could have just ended it one squirt before the girl squirted on her face. 
and not shown this weird consent violation. But they're like, no, nah, we're just going to end it with a weird porn contract negotiation stipulation. And what they left it in there because you... that's the hottest part. <laughs> it was the hottest, but to be honest, that's when I came. But Because uh... <laughs> you found someone you could identify with. You're just like, it's like I'm there. I feel included. I think the, my other, fa this one wasn't as weird, but it might've been my favorite porn video I ever found mm -hmm. was there's this video called Families Tied. Or no, it was called Family Ties. And it was shot like it was a sitcom, but it was stepbrother porn. So it, it's like this rascal of a stepsister comes and visits for Thanksgiving. And like while the mom's cooking in the other room, she gets down under the table and starts blowing the dad. And then the mom comes in the room and she's like, where's Becky? And the guy's like, oh, I don't know. I have no clue where she went. And like, it just turns into like a, it's very, it's shot lightly for incest. There's like a theme song with, you know, in like a theme song where it'll be like, It'll, it'll be like, and Becky, and she'll be like, <sighs> except she's just like blowing a dude. It's very bizarre. Like the and kind of like full house style theme song. I know what you're saying. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Except Where they like turn to the camera and smile. <laughs> but instead it's just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> she'll be like, <laughs> and then it, it, there's episodes and season. It was the most bizarre thing I've ever I. I quit jerking off and just started watching it, like, perplexed. I was just like, huh. They did it. They made the, they tried to make porn normal. Well, I have to say, good art is supposed to make you think. Not come. <laughs> <laughs> no, really good art is supposed to make you come. That's what happens when I saw Salvador Dali's clocks. I was just like, oh, they're melting off. Those that's why they're pretty hot. That's why they have plastic around the Mona Lisa, because if you go there, some dude just shot a load all over the Mona Lisa. It, yeah. It, uh, why do you think she doesn't have eyebrows? They got worn away over time. <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny you guys me this. My, my ex actually looked a little like the Mona Lisa to the point where like she got tagged in like a Facebook photo and um it was it was like a photo of like her friend with the Mona Lisa and like Facebook automatically tagged it as her. <laughs> but oh my God. I don't know if it was she looked like her in a hot way. It was sort of like more in a neutral a neutral way. Uh, if it's possible to neutrally look like the Mona Lisa. But you, you were attracted to her, of course. At the time, sure. Yeah. Not Did towards you, then <laughs> for a relationship, but sadly. Did you did you use that to your advantage? You're like, oh, I'm going to make you moan, uh, Lisa. Ooh. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm sad I didn't. Because what have a line. Pink, I'm going to have your pink and brown eye following me wherever I go around the room. <laughs> <laughs> she was always watching. <laughs> I'm going to make... I'm going to make you come so much the bottom half of your body is going to feel as numb, as non-existent as the Mona Lisa's body is. That was too wordy. That wasn't good. I'm sorry. It was very wordy. That w I'm sorry. I was thinking about like how there wasn't, I was like, oh, never mind. I personally like wordy jokes. I don't know why everyone gets on them. Um, th that also, to do a hard pivot. Um, mm. Chris, were you there for when we told the stories at Anne about like all of our worst bombs? uh yeah i i would i told a story okay because i was i was thinking about it i was thinking specifically about that joke i told you about the jesus joke how it bombed so hard i deleted it and that like from my evernote and then i had to um like ask you what the joke was um i told a joke the other day and it like at a zoom mic and it did really well so i guess i wanted to ask you again about like what it's been like for you performing in the new live comedy that's been happening and if you've had any like good or bad experiences you wanted to talk about it, like being outside and doing it um i mean it's different 
it, it's nice because comedians have kind of taken over the whole scene and taken back a lot of the power from comedy clubs. It's a bummer because really there's no mobility within the scene. Like the mm -hmm. best you can perform as tiny cupboard in a, to a certain extent. And there's a lot of different shows there. I, to be honest, I like rooftop shows compared to park shows. I had to do a show where we competed with a 10 year old's birthday party where they had a DJ. <laughs> they, he was just playing like 90s R&B all night. And frankly, it was way better than anything I was doing. I was just like, I, like, I had to scream. I had to talk about my dick for five minutes while I was yelling over Return of the Mac. And I was like, There's, that song's <laughs> better than my joke. But uh, it's been interesting. I don't know. I went and saw it. In Connecticut, Fairfield Comedy Club doing, like, I saw Mike Birbiglia and John Mulaney on a show. I saw Mike Birbiglia again. Saw Mike Birbiglia third. I like Mike Birbiglia. I uh, Mike Birbiglia, yeah. He's amazing. They have, like, a really nice setup back there because it's behind a motel. And every once in a while, like, a woodchuck will come running out of the woods. And Weird thing about that hotel, one of the 9-11 hijackers, stayed there before 9-11 and they don't advertise that for some reason because he did such wow. a good set <laughs> <laughs> but no uh, he killed uh... <laughs> oh it took me a minute oh boy <laughs> yeah it's nice to be able to do comedy zoom comedy was starting to get me really depressed where i'd yeah. go on there and i just didn't get the same i guess uh, self-esteem I normally get out of comedy like I would do well but I would just kind of walk out of there feeling empty which might have just been a quarantine thing and not a zoom comedy thing I think it's but, both uh, yeah yeah it's, it's just hard. like you, you feed off of like the audience so much it's like it's it's so much of it is just like the live experience of it and when that's removed you're just like sitting alone in your apartment and you're just like all right this is very empty like you get no like it's it's honestly a little bit like sex, like you don't a little bit like sex in the way you, like you get like a a come down from it, you get a denouement. Uh, but with like Zoom comedy, you're just like done, and then you're just thrust back into the reality of being alone. What is a where... denouement? Oh, that's like um the uh the bottom side of a climax in a story. Is the it sort French? of the falling the fa yeah, it's like the okay. falling action of a story. Did yeah. you ever heard that? Okay, never mind. No, I've never yeah, I guess you don't get the je ne sais quoi from. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, don't there's get the wee wee. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there is a. But yeah, there's so much about like just live performance that like, besides just doing the stand up, that is just part of like the experience of just like being around people and the mirth of it all. And you don't get any of that when you're doing Zoom. Yeah, the reason I brought it up in the context of bombs too is like I miss so much about live comedy being able to talk about like your bombs versus your successes. I feel like on Zoom it's mostly all the same or at least there is less variability between each set. In person I feel like you can either really crush or like not a soul can laugh and either way you kind of learn. I mean it sucks to bomb but I think I think I I honestly have never minded it so much maybe because it happens so often but also because I just don't mind, like, that's how you learn. You have to get the live feedback no matter what it is. I just missed it so much. Yeah. I uh, The other part I found with Zoom bombing is it's like when you go bomb at a live show, there's some buffer room where you bomb, you know you're the biggest failure in the entire world. You get on the subway, you, like, listen to some music, you kind of get out of it, and you're home, and you're separated from that bomb. But like yes. you bomb on Zoom, you just sit in your stink. Your failure just exists. Your home knows you're a failure now. That and... is, oh my God. No, please finish though. <laughs> oh no, that's <laughs> so rare to bomb in front of our pets. <laughs> you have to go like take a shower to get the stink off after a Zoom bomb. And then you go back into your living room and you're like, oh, I remember what happened here 15 minutes ago. <laughs> I know what you mean. It's weirdly so intimate, too, because, like, at least when you're in a crowd, like, everyone's like, okay, I've come here to watch stand-up, even if I'm another comedian. So it's not like I'll never be completely not paying attention. But when you're on Zoom, you can literally, if you put it in gallery mode, which I never do on a Zoom mic because it's too intimate, you can just watch people texting during your set if they hate you, 
which is oh, so do. rare to happen in a uh, in person mic. Really? I actually People... I feel like I I will often look back into the crowd, maybe if I'm sitting or if I'm just perform I will look and see like who's like on their phone, who's actually paying attention or It's slightly like, more subtle though, like on Zoom you can literally just not be paying attention at all at least in an in-person show i do think people are you can tell when people are like pretending to pay attention i guess yeah i uh when i do zoom i always find one person who i want to make laugh like when i when i was doing zoom mics i would always try i would put my zoom in on sharia's image because <laughs> she's got a very encouraging laugh where yeah. I would just watch Sharia and I'd be like, all right, I made Sharia laugh. That joke's good. Like, it's weird. Do you value certain people's laughs over other people? Absolutely. Absolutely. Although I do, I do try to, um, in order to make like a joke ironclad, I will actually try to focus on people I don't know. Because people I do know, I think, are going to be more inclined to give me a laugh. Um, consciously rather than subconsciously and i want the jokes to be so ironclad that they'll work on anyone uh so that the laughs will be involuntary like my uh my white whale of laughter was usama i always wanted to make usama laugh because <laughs> i knew he was the best comedian in the room and i was like if i can make usama laugh then i know i'm doing something right and uh, i don't think i ever did oh i'm sure you yeah. did but that's also oh, it's interesting did. It's interesting you guys say that. I feel like I have the opposite approach because I feel like if I think too much about who's laughing versus who's not laughing at my set, I get too into like my math brain of being like, well, this kind of person is my audience and this kind of person doesn't resonate. And then that just puts me way too in my head. And then I, yeah, when I'm in my head, I'm fucked up on stage. And when I'm focused, that's when I'm solid on stage. Yeah. It's when you're just like, submerging yourself just in your material and in nothing else and in just being present. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you ever get a, a laugh that's confusing? <laughs> yes, yes if it, but especially explain. if it, especially if it throws you off your rhythm and you have like an idea of the beats and how to even just like taking an intentional breath to give a bit of pause. But then like anytime you get, cause I, I'm curious, do you guys um feel like you riff more? Because like when I do stand up, it's, it's almost like, doing a play and that I've just it's very rehearsed I know every single beat it, I just memorized it and it's sort of like it has to be sort of perfect in my mind in order for me to do it and I riff very little I try to do the uh, opposite I try I try and be loose on stage because I again am too inclined to be I always try and do the thing that I feel like I'm not inclined to do because if I do the mm. thing I'm inclined to do I'm just gonna get too into my freaking routine but if I um if I let myself be loose on stage and riff a little, then I don't feel like I have to control everything. And that's also my kind of Achilles heel with comedy is just feeling like I need to have so much control and you can't ever really control anything. Yeah. See, I, I have jokes that I can tell word for word exactly the same every single time, but I kind of find that when I start doing that, I sound very sterile when I'm performing and that, especially with how goofy and just fucking odd I am when I'm just being goofy and odd that's I get a lot of laughs and I just kind of dig out a lot of material from it like I was riffing on I have a new joke about busting open my brand new vagina on the flight back from Thailand I love this one. and <laughs> I was talking as the pilot and I was just like like we're uh flying at a hundred and fifty thousand feet. <laughs> I have no clue how high planes fly. Uh, just bear with me. <laughs> so I, I I just started saying just different numbers. I'll be like, we're flying at um seven hundred and fifty feet in the sky. <laughs> 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 I think we uh we just clipped a wave over the ocean. <laughs> turn that joke into way. slowly just like the planes crashing <laughs> there's a I was hijacker really thinking 9-11 just like <gasps> oh my god what do you guys think is your most 
ambitious joke premise that you haven't turned into anything yet. Like for me, mm-hmm. it's for just to give you an example for me, a joke mm-hmm. I've never been able to crack the code on, but I love the premise of is like when it's about 9-11 actually, but it's not really about 9-11. It's about when you receive a work email or a casual sterile email and the date 9-11 is just very casually mentioned in it. Like I can't quite crack the code to it, but I just feel like when I get that email, it's like, okay, we can do the cleaning on 9-10 or on 9-11. I'm like, 9-11? No, we can't do it on 9-11. Yeah. I, I, yeah, Chris, go ahead. I don't know. I had a... Usually when I see a premise not working, I'll kind of forget about it. But I had a bit that... I wanted to do but have you ever had a bit you want to do but you're just not emotionally there yet because it involves something traumatic Mm. yeah because like I wanted to do a bit about my mom trying to commit suicide and it was about how I found the suicide note and had to call 911 and then I tried to hide the suicide note so that way it wasn't a suicide it was just uh something that didn't really make any sense at the time because we were all going to go to the hospital regardless (laughs) <laughs> we would have showed up and my mom's like I'm sorry I tried to kill myself and my dad and my brother would be like what and I've been like yeah I knew I, I knew before you guys uh it would have just been a weird moment but it's not funny it's really sad and when it bombed it just made me really sad yeah. so I haven't figured out if I can do this any kind of material on it yet but I haven't forgot about that I think I have the opposite problem with my traumatic joke because I do that one joke about my sexual assault and it always kills and I hate how much people like it because I'm like, Ooh. I it's don't think like, I've ever heard this. It's a, it's like, um, when I was 13, my grandpa touched me, but don't worry, it was the hot one. Um, <laughs> and it always does so well at these mics full of straight guys who don't like my real comedy. And I'm like, well, if you motherfuckers don't like my jokes about how like, ghosts should move spoons around or like whisper medical malpractice things in your ear like silly shit but you're gonna like it when I like unearth my deepest trauma to you like fuck that so I kind of stopped telling it and like it's a strong joke so I feel like if I were in a club setting I would probably default to it but I know what you mean Chris about like not liking an audience's reaction to something and it it's like bombing is never fun but then it's kind of like stubbing your toe while holding a knife that gets stabbed and stabbed into your leg. I, I don't know if that made any sense. Yeah. Uh, it's like burning your mouth on, I, I don't really, it's like burning your mouth on Indian food and then shitting out burning Indian food. It gets you both ways. <laughs> <laughs> You coming so, out or... It's like stubbing your toe while you eat Indian food while you stab <laughs> yourself. It's like cooking you a ever, bowl of soup. <laughs> you ever stub your toe while you're eating Indian food? Ah, oh, it's just like comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I love, this is how I talk to my therapist in like nonstop metaphors that make no sense. Oh my God. You're so like, I would... No, yeah, I was going to say, I would say for me, it was, um, it's because it was actually some advice that you gave me, Chris, about, um, a joke I did about, like, um, uh, coming out to my dad as vaccinated and you were, and you were very kind to me. You you were like, it's a good, it's a good joke, but using the phrase coming out, it's a very sensitive, very specific uh, phrase for the queer community that I get where you're coming from, but it's, it's not the best idea to use that phrase specifically. And, um, and I was like, thank you very much. And, and so I've still been trying to figure out a way to like make a joke about like revealing that to my dad. And I haven't, I haven't worked on it or touched on it in months um, about like the sort of like tantrum he threw when he found out, when I told him that I got vaccinated and I'm still, I'm still, I'm, yeah, I still haven't figured that one out about how to re- how to do it in a punchy way. What would the verb be if you were, uh, telling your romantic partner that you cheated on her. What, say that again? Like, 
I feel like the I was trying to think of what's the non coming out as gay version of coming out. Like what's the word for that? I was thinking maybe like a surprise vaccination party. Oh. Mm. <laughs> vaccination reveal party. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you like pop a balloon and it just has needles coming out. Surprise. <laughs> I don't you have pop- measles. <laughs> You pop the balloon and no, and measles just comes out. And you're like, I can breathe all this in. <laughs> oh my God. I, I just wrote that down. That was great. I love that. <laughs> yeah. But then uh, I also had, you know, but another thing is that I had, um, I wasn't sure, I was a, a little bit unsure if this would be like too controversial, but when my dad, um, when my dad reacted to it, he, because the thing is like my, yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm getting too in my head. Basically, my dad threw a tantrum when he he started like quoting statistics of like how many people get vaccines versus and still get infected with the disease they're vaccinated against. And he was just yelling. He wasn't listening to anyone. He wasn't looking me in the eye. And he was talking about how and he, and throughout my childhood, he's like, you know, it gives you like autism and stuff. But from like the way he behaved, I the punchline I that I thought might have worked that did work a few times, but not every time was that uh, was that I got vaccinated, but somehow I gave my dad autism and it would kill <laughs> just based on the way he reacted to it. And it would work sometimes, but in other times it would, a lot of people would go, Ooh, I'm not sure. And so, so yeah, it's, that's, that's my, that's my white whale of um, at least currently of. Uh, I hate when a joke works half the time. There's no yes. fix for it. It's like, this is either that's like my twilight joke it works half the time and the other half the time it's like what the fuck are you talking i I fucking love that twilight joke (laughs) (laughs) lucas i don't know if you heard it (laughs) do it do it do it it's like about how um stephanie meyer wrote this plot point in the fourth book of twilight about how when vampires have sex they break entire houses so my impression of her writing the book it's just her going, yeah, they fuck so hard they break the whole house. <laughs> <laughs> That's so adorable. That's the most variability I have in a joke. That's like either it will fucking break the room down or like they will kick me out of the mic. <laughs> I think it takes like a certain kind of person who like like loves fan fiction or loves like nerding out in the minutia of like a fantasy world or something. I hold on. Sorry, my my audio just like cut off for a sec. But yeah, I think it has to do with like that sort of that sort of person of like who enjoys that, you know? Yeah. Well, as we've talked about on this pod before, I'm a huge Twilight connoisseur and fan. Chris, what are your thoughts? You Twilight fan, Harry Potter, obviously not Harry Potter anymore. No, never got into Twilight, never got into Harry Potter. Uh, And this isn't even a J.K. Rowling ruined Harry Potter. I just always thought Harry Potter was a mediocre experience. What was your shit growing up? Uh, I don't know. I I read, do you ever read the Alex Ryder series? about like a kid no. spy i read some of that then i then i got into vonnegut and i just read that for like six years because i was a little bit of a douche <laughs> i own a copy of infinite jest like i read a lot of nonfiction, like books written by comedians right nice i want to hear you do a joke like i i, I read a lot of kurt vonnegut as a kid because i'm terrible <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as bad as the people who have two copies of Infinite Jest, but I have every single book. I've read every book that Kurt Vonnegut ever wrote. I don't know when I get the hate of Infinite Jest. Then again, I haven't read it. Like, I don't know anything about the book. I don't know. I own it. I own a copy of it, and I know that I will never read it because um, I when I bought a copy, my two best friends from college like put like a lock of hair inside of it and was like, if she's read this book, she'll discover this lock of hair and. I found out about it six years later because they told me, not because I opened the book. Mm. It, uh, I don't, I think it's just the people who rate it are unbearable because the mm. book itself, I've tried, I've read probably 200 pages in it and it's just a, it's a slog. It's like David Walsh Fallis 
just had like a <laughs> David Rastafaris. <laughs> had like a, a David Rastafari. <laughs> I feel like that's the name of the episode, David Waster Fallis. <laughs> David Foster Wallace. There's just so many words and they're complicated and the, the story's <laughs> not that interesting. And guys, I think they just have it so they can have like this. They're like, oh, I read this long, stupid book that no one else will read. But since no one else will read it, I'm better than them. But then there's those girls on Twitter who are like, I once slept with a guy who had a copy of Infinite Jest and he was he didn't have a bed and we dated for like <laughs> 10 years and we almost got married, but he never listened to me. It's like, okay, well, you do know you can choose your romantic partner, right? <laughs> you do know you have full autonomy over that choice. To be honest, I don't know if Infinite Jest has too much to do with that. Like, exactly, I, I think, but these girls on Twitter think it does. It's crazy. I don't think we can blame fuckboys on Infinite Jet. That seems like a leap. It's a, it's <laughs> a, it's a moonwalk. Just it's like all fuckboys read a shit ton of Infinite Jet. They just, they all, they have book clubs. This is their thing. This is where you get your snapbacks. This is. Fuck boys love to read. That's the biggest fallacy of this infinite all men like infinite jest thing is the idea that like if you're like a terrible man, like reading is your biggest hobby. Yeah. I find that weirdly adorable. <laughs> I wish it I was like that. I actually have a bit of a hard pivot that I want to oppose to Chris. And it's something I also want to oppose to you, Gabby, is what would you say is the thing that you judge people most for? Huh. Are we talking like small things or big things? Either. I would say either. I would say like for me, it's when you, this is my nitpicky thing is when people are not aware or don't seem to care about the noise that they're creating in a public space. Yeah, I've got that too. Yeah. Like I think, man, I think the city of New York should pay for everyone to get a pair of airpods and then if you play music just from your phone on the subway you get shot on the spot i, I like that a lot because <laughs> they're there you they can't be like oh well i don't have headphones they were given free airpods girl so. boss chris yeah. sure says give <laughs> apple a monopoly <laughs> <laughs> fine you can get bose wireless earpods if you really want to but it's I'm all about that AirPod lifestyle. Cool. I don't want to hear anything, not even the car that's about to hit me when I'm crossing the street. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you judge people on? I want to know. Yeah. All right. Chewing with your mouth open. Mm. Big one. If I see an adult chewing with their mouth open, I lose my shit. I can't yeah. stand it. I get so angry because I'm like, what happened? Like, it's so simple. Just close your mouth when you're chewing. And they just, they're like, so the other day. <laughs> and I'm like, Jesus, I can't eat. It ruins the whole dinner for me. And it makes me hate people like with a burning passion. Mm. Like I'm pretty sure that if I couldn't date someone who chews with their mouth open, I think I'd lose my mind. I think it might end in a homicide suicide situation <laughs> where I'd be like, you left me no choice. I had to kill. I'll just leave a note that says smack, 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 gob, gob, gob. <laughs> <laughs> but like the big, thing, <laughs> the big thing for me is when people can't tell what a giant asshole they're being. Yeah. And I think this kind of goes along with playing, being really loud somewhere where you shouldn't. Where they're just like, yeah, I screamed at that waiter. I'm like the best. <laughs> like, oh God, you're such a shitty person. Oh my, I, I hope you get coronavirus. Seems like you have a general distaste for just inconsiderateness. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I would say I'm exactly of, the same. I've just dealt with a little a lot, and it sucks. It's exhausting. 
because you, no matter how hard you try to explain to them that they're being in, in, inconsiderate, they they can't they don't have the processing in their brain to even consider other people. But yeah, what about hmm. Gabby? What about you? I would say mine is uh, it's something pretty irrational. I have a severe distaste. It's not that I don't like shy people, because I actually love shy people. I love introverted people. Everyone I've dated has been on, like, the shyer side at first, at least, and, like, kind of, like, opens up as you get to know them, so it's like that. But I hate people who, like, act mysterious, you know? They're, like, so some, I don't know if you guys have this experience. You meet a person, they don't really talk at all. And then, like, you ask them how their day is going, and they're like, ugh, you know, it's... I just watched a show that reminded me of my childhood. And you're like, what part of your childhood? And they're like, it's complicated. And I'm like, you're not, we're not in a movie. Like, just tell me what the fuck it is. You are not better than me because you think, like, your life is more inherently interesting. It's not. I think I just have a general irrational pet peeve for, like, if you think you're better than me, like, you're not. I'm just telling you that right now. Uh, the thing is, like, what you just said, this reminded me of a time where I was on a date with someone, and I was like, you know, like, what shows do you like? Do you like books? Like, just trying to get, like, what her interests were, and she just didn't really say much, and she was just like, what are you into? Or And it was just like, you're just trying to draw some sort of interest or specificity out of someone and they just give nothing. And that's what bugs me is when it's sort of like you want to play, you want to play like tennis, but you're just playing like handball. Yeah. I can't open no? up. I can't be vulnerable. There's people dying, Kim. Yes, you can. Like you can fucking tell you can be, vo it's not that hard to be vulnerable because most people are good. Yeah. Also racism. I don't know. That's another one for me. I, ju I, I am a little bit judgmental if a white person doesn't have any friends that aren't white. I'm like, you don't value having any kind of diverse feedback in your life. You don't like care. I have a question though. I have a question, I, Gabby. Uh, just a hypothetical. What if you Let's say uh, you, you're single and you meet a, a hot young lady who is from a very rural part of the country where literally this... That's different. I'm talking about like we live in New York City. Like obviously oh, yeah. like if you grow up in New York City or just somewhere where there is some level of diversity, obviously you're going to meet people with diverse perspectives. At least like... Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Also like... I value, you know, there can be diversity of thought. There are definitely people who just have friends who are like just in their sorority or just from their, you know, college or high school. I hate that shit. I'm like, I judge you if your friends are all clones of you, basically. Mm. Yeah, I've got a comment on this. I, uh, I that was, your description definitely fit me when before I went to college or actually even during college. I, I went, I lived in Fairfield County and went to a private school. It was just I literally, there is one, I'm one black kid in our whole class. It, it just, it was very hard to, it was just all white people. It wasn't hard at all. It's just that sometimes it's circumstance. But, uh, but now you're in New, but now you're in New York and that doesn't really describe you at all anymore. Yeah. So it's just like it. Oh yeah. I wouldn't judge yeah, now, someone now if that's where they're surrounded. But like, if you're in one place where there is diversity of thought and you're not, you know, surrounding you yourself know, with different perspectives. Do you know how difficult it is to be a white kid growing up in an all-white school where everybody just oh likes my. you for who you are? Preach on, sister. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. No. <laughs> Speak your piece, little mama. <laughs> You're like, but Chris, you were trans. And I'm like, not at that point. <laughs> So wait, Chris, also, before we get into the audience submissions, which I guess we'll get into in a little bit, you started doing comedy before you transitioned, right? Yeah. Uh, I didn't do it very much. I probably did it like 20 times before I transitioned. Hmm. What was it, what was it like? Like, were you always into comedy? Like, was that always a path you wanted to pursue? Yeah. I mean, I, I've wanted to be a comedian since I was like 10. And then I kind of gave up on it when I was 14 because I'm like, I have to get a real job. And then about eight, 16, I was like, 
I hate everything about this world. I just want to do comedy. And so I started telling people. And once I told people, I had no choice but to do comedy because I don't want to be an asshole. So, uh, yeah, no, my, my comedy before I transitioned was angry, like extremely angry. Uh, it was trying to, it, I just tried to be as controversial as possible. Literally the, just one of the worst kind of comedians ever. Uh, and I transitioned and I was like, oh, okay, well, I actually have something to talk about now. I won't just, uh, like, I don't know. I just wrote, after, it was like after the Las Vegas shooting, I was just like, oh boy, I'm going to write so many jokes, one for each person who died. And I ended up <laughs> filling a note. <laughs> <laughs> And I ended up filling a notebook full of jokes that were just like, I mean, there had to be one guy at that country music festival where when he heard the shots rang out, was like, thank God I don't have to hear country anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I just Or like someone like, who was taken there on a date who was just like, oh, a break. <laughs> I was just like, anytime something bad happened in the news, I wrote about it. And mm. they weren't particularly good jokes. They were just shocking jokes. That is something people describe when they transition is like there is a lot of like repressed anger when you are either consciously or unconsciously hiding it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I've always wanted to do this. Now I'm doing it, but I'm trans and it's not the easiest being a trans comedian ever, but uh, I want to, I want to pave this fucking road. I know the like Jay McBride and uh, Robin Tran are like kind of the at the forefront right now, but I'm like steaming up the back. Yeah, you gotta steamy backside. <laughs> <laughs> Just a boiling spine. <laughs> Just a uh, misty rear end. Yeah, I do uh, love yes, the idea. paving the road with her misty rear end. <laughs> I do love the idea that um, you could be like, oh, yeah, the one thing that hasn't changed about me through my transition is I still just go, ooh, whenever there's a national tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> Time to get to writing. Just like. No, now it's like, aw. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like a little bit of moment of sadness, and then it's just like, oh, I'm such a funny bitch. That was a face journey. You just went on. That was awesome. Pendulum. What a crescendo. Well, we're about to hear some personal tragedies from people's yes. lives. Um, Lucas, I have the list pulled up. So, Chris, we, right want your, we want your... Wait, go on. Sorry. Uh, my headphones are about to die. Can I swap them out really quickly? It'll take a second. Of yeah, course yeah. We'll, we'll, you we'll take can. A break. We'll thing. take All a right. commercial break. And we are back. Uh, Gabby, do you want to take it away? Sure. Okay. Hey, y'all, I have some tea to share, but it requires some context, so buckle yourself in for this ride. So I recently moved to NYC for grad school. I've been here for a month now. I'm a piano major, and I go to an independent conservatory that isn't Juilliard because I'm not that talented, LOL. Well, don't put yourself down. Anyway, a few weeks ago, I met up with another piano student who has the same teacher as me. However, upon meeting her, I found that she didn't pass my friend vibe check, and here's why. When we met up, one of the first things she said to me was, hi, yeah, I don't really care about this COVID stuff. Like, it's dangerous how much I don't care about it anymore. I kid you not, she said this verbatim. And she got COVID earlier this year. I think she thinks she's invincible because she survived the first time. She did wear a mask, but I had to go out of my way to stand an appropriate distance away from her. We walked over to get lunch. And while we got to know each other, the conversation was just not great. First off, she said pretty much upfront that she isn't paying tuition or rent because she got incredibly lucky with a good scholarship and a rich donor who covers the rest. I personally don't like to talk about financial situations, so this made me really uncomfortable. Then we talked about music for an hour, and I tried to ask what she does when she's not practicing piano. Uh, because if you don't have to worry about paying tuition or rent, you must have free time, right? Not her. She looked at me like I was crazy, and she said, yeah, I practice all day. I can't even watch a movie or anything without feeling like I'm wasting valuable time. That line sent me into God. a spiral. 
she starts talking about music philosophy and I'm over here just dissociating because I cannot believe what she just said. Every question afterwards that she asked me was super targeted as if she was trying to analyze my skill set in order to determine if I was a threat or not. I don't know if you've ever experienced this in your own fields, but in music, it is incredibly anxiety producing to have people rank you based on factors like talent, hard work, or how big and fancy your scholarship is. I ended up walking home feeling incredibly defeated and frustrated. I came in hoping to make a new friend because making friends during a pandemic is already hard enough, but I just left feeling disappointed at the whole ordeal. The only nice thing about that day is that she paid for my lunch. <laughs> Otherwise, she didn't pass my friendship vibe to check. I want friends that are supportive of my hobbies, not shaming me for wasting my time or just a friend who has an interest in something that isn't directly related to work or school. It's tiring to hear people talk about work all the time, right? Anyway, feel free to comment on how you would feel about meeting a person like this. I'm a little bummed that making new friends in the city is proving to be this tough, but hopefully things will change soon. P.S. I'm sure this is supposed to be anonymous, Lucas and Gabby, but feel free to DM me at redacted if you want more tea. Musician tea is always messy and hilarious, and I have plenty more to share if you're interested. Well, we probably will. Sure. What do you guys think? I'm, I mean, this person just, it just sounds like you have very different priorities. It's also, I don't like someone who can't relax well. You mm. know? Like, this is a person who, oh, I don't think can relax well, who can't enjoy stuff outside of their profession or what, or their passion. That, I always think that that sounds very unhealthy to me when you don't have a healthy interest in other stuff um, and other media or whatever. And so, yeah, it just doesn't sound like that cool of a person. And so, yeah, uh, I kind of find that that person that person sucks to be around. But I'm always <laughs> jealous of their work ethic. Like that girl is gonna make it in piano. <laughs> 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 She's gonna be. I don't know where you go with piano. Like, I, I guess kind of the peak to me would be you play piano man at a piano bar, and the <laughs> girl walks in. And he's like, with man. a piano tie and a piano shoes. <laughs> he just comes in and he screams, piano! And he just runs out. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, I always think, I'm like, I kind of get it. Because there is one side where if I tried to do that, I would end up being probably very unhappy. And it would mm. ultimately cause me to not be able to pursue comedy. But at the same time, those people are going to get a lot further, a lot faster. So I understand kind of both perspectives it's sort of shitty to lay that lifestyle out on someone when they're just looking for a friend though. Mm. Yeah. It's, I think that with comedy it might be a little different because with comedy, you need inspiration from real life. Like I feel yeah. like the best inspiration you get is when you like, at least in the before, you know, you could go to four mics a night or you could go to like one mic and then end up at dinner with a friend and you and your friend start having a conversation. And you're like, oh, this is making me think of a joke to do it another mic. Whereas you did your same fucking thing for four mics in a row, you wouldn't have gotten that. So there does have to be a balance. And I think that that's probably true of music in so far as if you practice anything too much, you lose the passion, like you lose the thread. The thing is also it, what it reminded me of, I don't know if uh, either of you saw the Michael Jordan uh, the Last Dance, that documentary series on ESPN. I watched it and I loved it. But the thing is, you, you really get an understanding. I didn't watch, I've never really watched basketball ever, but you really get a sense of just how obsessed Michael Jordan was with winning at getting as good as possible and with an almost violent intent to destroy the other team that he had every single game he had. And he pushed everyone else on his team to be the same way. And he was like, I would say definitely unhealthily obsessed, but it also worked. He, he was, that's the why he's like the greatest basketball player of all time, because he, he just devoted every single bit of his energy toward it. And, and so I'm wondering if maybe this person has like a similar drive towards piano that I think sort of like what Chris said is that maybe it doesn't sound like you'd be that fun to be around, but you might be the best piano player of all time. But the thing is, is, is being the best piano player of all time, is that the best thing to be in life? Or do you want to be like a great piano player, but also a nice person as well? So. Have you, have you seen the movie Whiplash? No, I haven't. Not yet, no. Uh, oh shit, you gotta see that movie, it's amazing. But it's about this like kid who wants to do jazz drumming 
and uh, he meets J.K. Simmons, who's like this famous but kind of washed up uh, jazz composer. Composer, and there's this one scene where his parents are like, "Are all you gonna do is this?" And he's like, "The thing is, if I'm great, that's better than anything you guys could ever do." Mm. And it's sort of that that holding what you want to do above all every other aspect of life. At the same time, so I went to a lot of schools growing up that were like based around like your prestige in whatever way. So I went to like arts high school and then I went to like kind of a whatever prestigious academic program in college. And I think my least favorite conversation is the one around what are you up to, which is a coded way of saying like, how can I rank you? Um, I think the, the, at, at least for me, the time in my life in which I met like the people who I consider my best friends in the world are the times when I was doing nothing, smoking weed every day, like eating all like 20 pounds heavier. And the people who love you the most and know you for who you are, are the people who have just seen you at your rock bottom. And those are the people who get you through the hardship and like the people who just want to play the piano all day. If you have a fucking crisis, if you're like standing on a bridge about to kill yourself, they're not going to stop their piano recital to help you. You know, they're going to be like, I'm sorry, I'm about to play piano. I can't (laughs) come help you. And that sucks because sure, piano is important to them, but like having a friend who would drop everything for you is probably the most important thing you could have. And for me, I I don't think I would ever give that up for anything. Yeah. I have a, another submission pulled up. Shall I read it? Yes, please. Okay, Go okay. for it. My weirdest phobia is ornithophobia, which is a fear of birds. There were three incidents before the age of 10, two of which involved very close proximity to a peacock. I was, I was about six and we went to a wildlife park. I went down a slide in the playground and waiting for me at the bottom was a giant blue peacock with all its feathers out. Didn't we read this one on the first episode and our conclusion was like, well, then that's valid. (laughs) Oh, yeah, we did. I'm sorry. Well, Chris, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Let's get your take. I don't know. Was there an attack or was there just a peacock? I Mm. think it was like smashing into it, like straight, like crotch into the neck. Just like. I, that peacock, I think he, the kid's to blame for not looking down the slide. I did I don't know. I don't understand phobia, like, phobias are weird. They just kind of come up out of nowhere. Like, I kind of have a phobia of fire alarms. I had a a couple of years ago, I had a weird experience with a fire alarm that kept going off at the exact same time every night. And it just scared the living shit out of me. And to this day, anytime a fire alarm goes off, it freaks me out so much. I've run out of the apartment no matter what I'm doing. And uh, so I don't know, I, I don't really, it sucks that you have a bird phobia, especially if you're living in Manhattan. Like, I can't imagine how hard it is to get around mm. being afraid of every pigeon on the street. <laughs> I wouldn't suggest eating bagels while you're walking around or anything. Yeah. Avoid densely populated areas where there's a lot of garbage that attracts pigeons. You won't do well. Yeah. You can't go to the beach. Uh, bird watching is out of the question. You can't go to Antarctica. That's where all the penguins live. You're to be fair, you bird watching is always out of the fucking question. <laughs> this they can't even watch NBC because every single time the logo comes up, they just go like, "Ah, NBC." <laughs> <laughs> the f- the fire alarm thing, by the way, I think is kind of valid because that is actually what you're supposed to do when you hear a fire alarm. And there's too many people who are like. Well, I'm just going to ignore this. Like, it could be a fire. You don't know. No, no, no. This is like, it, it, it shakes me to my core. I end up, last time it happened, I end up not sleeping for like three days. It just, it really fucks me up. Oh, shit. Or I just, I keep waiting for this fire alarm. And then I'm like, I'm 25. <laughs> I cannot be afraid of fire alarms. This is just so embarrassing. Like, I talked to my therapist about it. My therapist is like, I can't do anything about this. This is just, this is this what fire? You could set your own fire drills. <laughs> I didn't even get burned in a fire. That's the most embarrassing part. <laughs> okay. Oh, I have a I have another submission here that I definitely don't think we've um we've done. Okay. So um, 
All right, here are some phobias I have. Feel free to judge me accordingly. I split them into two categories of rational and irrational fears. My rational fears include scorpions and any large insect that has the capacity to harm me in any way. Water snakes, dying painfully, and threatening strangers in public places. Maybe fear of insects is more, is more rational than anything, but I grew up in Texas and had to deal with scorpions often. And the worst part is that they drop from ceiling vents and like to hide in pillowcases. Holy shit. I knew someone who went to sleep and woke up with a giant swollen head because in the middle of the night, they got stung by a scorpion. Zero out of 10, not something I would like to experience. Yeah, that, that's very rational. That, I hope your friend, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very rational. Okay, irrational fears include airplane bathrooms and mushrooms. For a second, I thought it's like airplane bathrooms and airplane mushrooms. I thought that's, I thought, <laughs> I just, dist- I was like, distributive property? No, okay. Okay, airplane bathrooms flush too violently for my liking. That's true. And yes, and they're so loud in all caps, this is said. I'm not afraid to use public bathrooms, and I'm not even afraid to poop in said spaces, but I hate going to the bathroom on an airplane, and I've even gone far as to, as to only use the bathroom twice on a 14-hour international flight. Wow. They really do flush very sharply. It's just like, shoo, they, it's really, it's jarring every I time. I have to cover my ears every time. I've never, it hurts so bad. Also, every experience on an airplane is bad. I hate flying. Yeah. I love airplane bathrooms. <laughs> One, I always go into airplane bathrooms and hit my jewel. So like it, I oh I get God. up and go pee on a 1-hour flight, I'll get up and go pee three times. Oh, so you have uh, a positive association with them. Like yeah. I like pooping on airplanes just because it eats up like 15 minutes of the flight. Hmm. Uh and then it used to be before I transitioned, I used to not all the time, but for like a five hour flight, usually what if I was flying between Denver and Connecticut, I would jerk off on planes. Just to like <laughs> it takes like ten minutes, you you feel nice and relaxed. I normally would have a drink, go into the bathroom, I would like jerk off. Except one time I like came into the toilet bowl and I hit the flush and it didn't get sucked out. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so that is stressful. Like a, I had to get a piece of tissue paper and like scrape it into the hole. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Tough to top that. <laughs> that is Oh my god. Yeah, Gabby, you ever masturbated on an airplane? I haven't. I've not been so lucky. Is it or I, I don't think I have, but is it bad to say I just had to think about it? <laughs> <laughs> The fact that I had to think about it makes me, th- I, I, I used to do it in like the high school bathroom a lot, really? not to completion, just mm. like I was bored, you know? Actually, I, I did it in the high school, in my high school bathroom. Who, ha- who among us hasn't done, Lucas, come on. I've never masturbated in my high school bathroom. Never what are we doing that. this podcast for? This is bullshit. <laughs> I'm just a, I'm just a little weenie, just a little baby cuck boy, just never... <laughs> Just never masturbating. I'm such a little bitch. Um, okay, here's another one. One time, a guy who went to my church when I was like eight gave me $20 in a drive through where I work and drove off without his change. And then we realized it was a fake 20. I still think about it a lot. And that's oh. it. <laughs> the whole story. It's just a counterfeit should- money situation. I, I guess. You put that shit in the register, take the change, and keep it as a tip. That's my suggestion to that. You, I, though, you're not responsible. The, the people who work at the restaurant aren't responsible to pick out fake $20 bills. That's such nonsense. I think they should just value fake money as real money. Real money is fake money. Just uh, money is fake. We made it up. There is uh, the other day, or like the cryptocurrency is the future. Just (laughs) (laughs) I never got into Bitcoin. I had parents who loved me, so I didn't need to. (laughs) (laughs) 
Did you ever see the stories of like a, a kid who like used his like bar mitzvah money to invest in Bitcoin? And he's like, and he made a deal with his parents. He was like, if I can be a millionaire by the time I graduate high school, I don't have to go to college. And he did it. And so he's like, yeah, I don't have to go. And I was just like, who, what kind of, what kind of relationship do you have with your parents where you could do that? I'm just one where you have a million dollars and they can't say shit because you're 18. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Although if you had a million dollars, go to college, you're going to have a lot of fun. Like, yeah, you're also not, you're going to graduate with most of it still and zero debt. That's, oh my God. Yeah, very, very so Yeah, lucky. so what we're saying is if you're a millionaire, you should go to college. <laughs> <laughs> Look at us giving advice to millionaires. Millionaires don't need advice, do yeah, they? Yeah, so if you're well, if you're a teenager millionaire, go to college. It's a great move. They're saying that we need to lower tuition. No, kids just all need to be millionaires. <laughs> <laughs> I had another uh, one pulled up here, but now I can't find it. Um I'm looking, I'm looking through them as well. Oh, okay. This is inter an interesting one. Uh, I grew up near a bunch of rivers that were super dangerous, like dozens of deaths yearly from people drowning. And now I'm kind of scared of rivers. They have always been so ominous to me. Like they look peaceful, but if you go into them, there's an evil hellscape that will trap and drown you. Well, I need to know where this is and what is... Okay, it's, I grew up near a bunch of rivers that were super dangerous. Like <laughs> it was the Nile. It's Moses writing. <laughs> I was this baby on a raft. It was so weird. They just put me in a basket on this river, and now I'm and like everyone, afraid. Like, and everyone stole my idea, so I killed them. Just like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not afraid of rivers, but I do understand the fear of the unknown. Like not, mm. I think that has a lot to do with my fear of rats, which Chris, you know about, because we were on a train platform once and I freaked out so much at a rat that I almost left the train platform and my soul like left my body. But it's just Daddy that- tried to use me as a human shield. Oh my God. She pushed me at the rat. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I and thought I maybe you could rats, talk to so him. I I was fine with that. Yeah, so it was a favor. It's like you guys are great that friends. Mean, that means you're a turf now. I'm just letting you know you're a turf. Oh, <laughs> that is just so classic. Transphobic Gabby. That's what they call me. <laughs> She's like, if you were an actual woman, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> JK Rattling. Sexy uh, genitalia. Okay. <laughs> Oh, this was the other one I wanted to, I, I lost yes. this one before, but okay. I, let's say, let's only do like a couple more and then we'll end it, shall we? Yes, perfect. Yes. Right. I think my neighbors are concerned about me. My boyfriend and I watch a lot of true crime documentaries and listen to a lot of true crime podcasts with the windows open. One day my neighbor made a joke that she wondered if we listen to all this to learn how to get away with murder. I joked back and said, yeah, that is exactly why. Flash forward to the next day when I was practicing my archery in the garden. <laughs> what? And her okay. head literally just pops over the top of the fence like Casper the friendly ghost and whispers, is that a real bow? I reply saying, yeah, I love the sport and it is great for hunting. FYI, I don't hunt. I just use it as target practice and core muscle strengthening. As soon as I said the word hunting, she went pale as I've ever seen and hurried inside. It occurred to me later that given our recent conversation, oh my God, no, I just lost it again. I was scrolling. Oh my God, where is it? No, hunt, I'm control F. Wait, yeah, come at, yeah. Um, probably meant hunting in a different context than I did. Update, it has been three weeks and I've not seen this woman since our last conversation. Every time I hear her, I try and pop out and say hi and she literally bolts indoors. How would you recommend I remedy this situation? I don't want this woman to be scared of me. I am sweet, I promise. <laughs> I have so much to say, but can I just say, if you, I assume if you have an archery range in your backyard, you're in like a rural town. First of all, mm. you have an archery range in your backyard. Second of all, you are listening to true crime podcasts with the windows open. You're clearly in a wide open space place. That, that means you're like blasting true crime at full volume. Mm. 
your neighbors <laughs> should be scared of you. <laughs> or just like very exhibitionist with like your interests and skills. Like I want people to know what I spend my time thinking about. I think about killing and I practice killing. Get in my way, I dare you. Just like. I think there's no way to remedy the situation. I think you just made your own bed and now you have to sleep in it. Yeah. <laughs> no. Or no, you just have a... to get into murder now. That's just, you just have to just. <laughs> Clear remedy. Next time you see her, you just scream. You're like, I'm not going to kill you. You're not my type. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Absolutely perfect. I go for the bad people. Just like, ugh, you think you're worth killing? So egotistical. Just like. <laughs> this just feels to me like one of those stories where, you know when someone's telling a story where like everyone in the story except them is an idiot, but it's like, clear, like the story's clearly like they're kind of in the wrong. Like, reader, I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I just feel like you're probably, like, I can only imagine that these podcasts are at, like, wildly, like, high decibel volumes. I would say also maybe pick up another hobby, like, because I think, like, true, I have an issue with, like, true crime podcasts. I think, like, murder is actually just really sad, you know? Mm. No, uh, it's interesting. <laughs> you think so? I love, a, I love a good murder. Like, if there's a murder that they can't figure out, but it's clear who did it. Oh, I eat that shit up. Do you have an example? Uh, I was watching this one called Evil Genius, and it was about these, mm -hmm. like, this, it's called Evil Genius, but these people are the stupidest people that have ever been put on Earth. And they uh, kidnapped this guy and strapped a bomb collar to his neck and then had him rob banks, but they didn't give it a big enough timer so he robbed one bank and then exploded on the side of the <laughs> Now that's, that's adorable. That's funny. Adorable? What the fuck is yeah. that, you guys? Because it went wrong. It's adorable. It's like, oh, I, I set the timer. Oops, oh, oopsie daisy. Oh, no murder gone bad. Oh, I got a case of the Mondays. Just like. <laughs> got blown up just like i find that really that's like monty python for some reason just like oh they're like, like i want to hear a at the end they're like you set the timer to 30 minutes right and he's like 30 seconds <laughs> 30 minutes 30 you said 30 seconds he didn't get past the front lawn, man. It, it had to be 30 <laughs> minutes. He, he exploded on the sidewalk outside of our house. It's clear that we did it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just okay. wouldn't be surprised if we heard about the archery murderer like three months from now. <laughs> we get interviewed I really by the hope cops. so. I hope we hear. Imagine if we're used as like a primary source in like a news reporting of it. Oh. I've always wanted that to be me. I've always wanted to go to court and like be on yeah. the witness stand and t and talk about my experiences with someone. I think there was someone who went on Kill Tony who then like murdered or did some some sort of violent crime and they had like um a uh, Brian Redband from it just like come on the news to talk about. It. They were like, "Yeah, he was this dude who came on and he was okay. We did <laughs> like he talked about how well he did on the show." Well, how and sweet just, yeah but yeah that would be awesome okay i have uh all right let's okay so this is one last one i have a phobia i've not been able to see all my limbs at once like if it's really dark and i can't see my arm i'll be scared something's gonna going to come like attack it or if it's really funny and it's my feet also be worried that something's gonna come and get me what is fine like with, which is fine like with duvets and blankets, but for some reason like nothing else. Thanks, Hannah. <laughs> so Did she this, wear so, shoes? <laughs> I can't I mean, see my feet. I'm wearing <laughs> shoes. Just, I'm just, I'm flabbergasted. I have no idea what to say. I'm just afraid that someone's gonna come snatch your limbs away if you can't see them at all times. Like, 
I think you'd be very I, good at crunches if you just like using your core muscles to just keep all your limbs in view at all times. I think it'd be funnier if this was the dude and he's like, yeah, yeah even when I have sex with women, it's like <laughs> dick goes in, I'm like, ah, and then it comes out. I'm like, oh, it's still there. And dick goes in, it's like, ah, and then dick comes out. Oh, it's still okay, okay. She's like, put it in. No, I, I have to be, I'm sorry, I have to be able to see it. <laughs> like I can only date women with translucent vaginas. <laughs> Could you, you need imagine? To have very pale. <laughs> Chris, I think when you get the surgery, you should get a translucent vagina. I can only I can only use a flashlight with a window. <laughs> Otherwise, I think it's a, a Chinese finger trap scenario. Just like ah. I do think it's nice the idea that people could custom like customize like you could get it maybe different colors or patterns. I want one to, with a cup holder built in. <laughs> USB charger. <laughs> I thought you meant as like a way to test like your your dick's core strength to hold up like a cup on the side, just like hmm, just. What if I could uh, set it up? You know those greeting cards where when you open the card, it plays the song. So yeah. like if someone puts a dick in my vagina, it's just like all night long, all night. <laughs> But ever no, but every time it comes out and goes back in, it starts at the beginning. <laughs> it's just like at first you just feel like all night, all night, and then at the end it's just like ah 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 ah. Yeah. It's just <laughs> you can't get all past night, the all first <laughs> And then finally at the end it's just like all night long. Oh, it can feel the dick shrinking as they. Oh, all and, the, night and, it, and the sound warps like all night long. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, well, I think you broke it. <laughs> and that's how we know we're done. Oh, what a good episode. Thank you, this Chris. This was sure. so much fun. Chris, do you have I anything to plug? Doing it. Yes, uh, please. Yeah, I actually have a few things to plug. Uh, my Instagram is Chris underscore sure. And it's sure, S-H-U-R-R, -R, not S-C-H-U-R-R. -R. It's, wait, sorry, I've got a. All right. Um, yeah, I've got a show on October 15th at 7 p.m. outside of the Brooklyn Museum. I've got a show October 18th at Fairfield Comedy Club. Uh, show October 24th, which you can DM me if you want details. And then another show October 31st, which is a Halloween show that I was told by my friend Anne will be in a graveyard. Which no. seems disrespectful to the dead. That's like, <laughs> it'd be one thing to shit on someone's gravestone, but to host an open mic at some, or a, a show, a comedy show on someone's gravestone. I'm going to look up all the gravestones and do my set from the most conservative person I can find. I hope you don't like, you know how you were saying you were competing with a birthday party? <laughs> Please don't be competing with someone in mourning. <laughs> There's just a woman there crying, and I'm like, will you shut up? <laughs> the audience can't hear me talking about my balls. Stop uh, heckling, lady. I want you to then, like, uh, improvise a connection to the person by the gravestone who you're, like, doing your set on top of. Like, no, like, um, Ira Melvin is my uncle. Uh, he died in 1902. I have very old generation of parents, so just... Eh. And like, just like coming with like a long winded story of like why you're, you're valid to do comedy there. <laughs> like, uh, I'm like, oh. Uh, this is how I grieve. Marnie Stinson actually left me this plot above her dead body for to do comedy on in her will. <laughs> Never she met said the if I didn't do comedy, it would be desecrating her name. So yeah. <laughs> it's free real to estate that. to only me. <laughs> Well, please go see Chris Scher at the Grave yeah. <laughs> comedy show. And uh, we are two nosy meerkats. This yes. has been I actually, episode. I have something to plug. I will be doing uh, Sharia Mattis's Zoom comedy uh, show this Saturday at Loud Bitch Comedy on Instagram. You can find the info for that. Uh, yeah. Gabby, do you have anything to plug? Never. No, just kidding. I don't know. You can sign up for my open mic online. Yes. <laughs> yeah, online. It's called Anne Hathaway Presents. We post on Instagram a lot. Um, I'm writing a pilot, but that's like private, you know. 
Ooh. I'm not going to plug it. <laughs> What's the pilot about? I'm writing two, actually. So TBD. You'll see. You'll all see. Okay. But okay. thank you guys again. And please tune in next week. Yes. Yep. Thank you okay. for having me. So good having you, Chris. We love you. All right.